turn in your Bibles to the lesson we heard a bit uh, earlier, the book of Acts. I want to look at chapter 3 with you. You will recall from the context of what you heard that this story happens almost at the very beginning stages of the early church. This was a very difficult time. This was a time when the early church was trying to make sense of its identity, trying to understand its mission. Who are we? What are we supposed to do? What are we all about? How are we to be related to the Jewish community out of which Jesus calls the church? into existence. The book of Acts is a, is a great book to really understand the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those early disciples, those early believers. If you are a new Christian or if you are a new believer and you come into the faith recently, it will be a tremendous blessing to visit this book and to see how the early church got it together. It wasn't easy by any means. But they trusted in the process. They trusted in what Jesus promised. They trusted the words of Jesus at a time when Jesus was not physically present with them. Remember that this was a time when Jesus had already left them. He died in their vision, in their sight. He rose, they were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Many times Jesus appeared to them, he taught them, he gave them words to, to live by. And yet, there came a time when he was taken up from among them. He ascended back to his father. But before that he said, I'm going to give you a promise. I'm going to promise you that you will receive power from above, from on high. Tarry in Jerusalem until you are endowed with the power from high. He was referring to the power of the Holy Spirit. Because he said, without the Holy Spirit, you cannot really accomplish anything. But if you wait, and the power of God will come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was the promise that he gave the disciples. They believed that promise, and in earnestness, they waited for this power in Jerusalem. They were praying every day. And on that day of Pentecost, the book of Acts tells us in chapter 2, the power of the Spirit of God came mightily upon the disciples. So powerful was this manifestation of the Spirit of God in their lives that people who had come there for the celebration of Pentecost, the festival, were amazed at what they saw. That was the birthday of the church, we say. The beginning of the early church, the New Testament church. So we find that the very next chapter, chapter 2, the Holy Spirit coming down upon the disciples, chapter 3 is where we take our story, today's story. So in a sense you can say that this is one of the early manifestations of the presence and the mind of God. My sermon is entitled, The Power of God. The Power of God. If there is anything that we learn in the scriptures, it is that nothing happens without the power of God. It is not by your smartness, it is not by my intellect, it is not by anything that a church can do, but it is by the power of God. All the money in the world cannot save one person 
All the power and influence of all humans put together cannot make one person right with God. Many have tried that and have failed miserably. That peace that people seek in their heart cannot come from human means and methodologies. It comes by the act of God. When God sent His Son Jesus Christ into the world, God knew that we could not ever become right with God by our own doing. For it is by grace you are saved by faith, not of yourself. It is a gift that God bestows on us. The early church recognized that, they realized that. So here in this third chapter, we find an account of a very ordinary thing. Two disciples are going to the church as much as all of us came to church this evening. What was that extraordinary about that? You left home, you got ready, got in the car, you drove over here, you parked your car. I'm sure you found a space because the church was almost, the parking lot was almost empty when we came. No big deal, you just walked in the door and you took your place. Something that the early church had done day after day after day. Every day, the scripture tells us, every single day, they gathered in the temple for prayer. Now, earlier on, we had a lot of uh, conversation about prayer. I thank uh, Sudhakar and the worship team for, for singing that song about prayer. Call it the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer. It is all about prayer. It is a wholesome prayer. It is the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, addressing God as our Father, Abba, Daddy. The disciples were going to the temple to pray. Peter and John are the two that are mentioned here. One day, Peter and John were going to the temple for the at the time of prayer. And what was the purpose of that? It was simply to join with fellow believers and to have a communion with, with the Lord. Remember now, a few days back, before this occurrence, before this experience of prayer in the temple, these disciples were asked by Jesus to come and join in a prayer time. You remember the story? In Matthew 26, we read about the time when Jesus says, come with me and let us pray. And he takes them to this garden called Garden of Gethsemane, not very far from Jerusalem, right on the outskirts, maybe a mile or two. And he invites them into a season of prayer. My soul is distressed, he says. I am troubled and I want you to support me. I want you to join me in prayer. So that was said he. He didn't want to join long prayers. I can relate to that as well. But Jesus says to Peter and James and John, come with me and pray in the garden. And then he goes a little bit further and he falls on his knees praying to his father, let this cup pass from me but nevertheless, not my will, but let thine be done. Scripture says he prayed for a while, and then when he came back, what happened? Where the three praying, James, John, and Peter, what were they doing? They were, come on, say it aloud. They were sleeping. How many times have you gone to all night prayer and you slept for a good part of the night? How many times have you come to church? And you slept a good part of the service. I mean, I see you. <laughs> Not today. But I see you from time to time. You come and then you take a back view and then you say, you know, I'm going to just, it's air conditioned, it's very nice, relax. You know, like when you go to the massage parlor, you relax, and you close your eyes, it's a nice experience, right? You go to church and you relax and pretty soon you're gone. Your mind has taken you to somewhere else. Until suddenly you wake up and then you realize, oh, I'm still in church. I better listen to what's going on. That's what happened to the disciples. They slept. Jesus comes and wakes them up. I invited you to prayer, not to sleep. 
pray with me. And then he goes back and then what happens? After a while he comes back and they were back sleeping. Back sleeping. And then third time he says, don't sleep. Watch and pray. And they were still sleeping the third time he says, enough. The time is at hand. The betrayer is on the way. They completely miserably failed the prayer test. Because they didn't understand what prayer was all about. They didn't really realize the significance of prayer. They didn't connect with Jesus. They were not with him. They didn't quite understand what is the meaning of prayer. What is the importance of prayer? But now, they knew what prayer was all about because they saw what happened to Jesus. They saw that God raised him from the dead. They saw the resurrected Jesus not once or twice, but several times. And he taught them the meaning of trust in God. They knew. That's why time and again they say, we are eyewitnesses to what has happened. You and I are also eyewitnesses to what God has done in your life and in my life. There is no denying anymore. There is no betraying anymore. There is no running away from it anymore. We have total trust and confidence in this God who has done a marvelous thing in Jesus Christ. The early church, the post-Pentecost church, was a church that had power to reckon with. And that power was not in them, it was the power of God. And until and unless the church of Jesus Christ once again manifests this confidence, this trust in a God who is able to do far beyond what you and I can imagine or ask, we will not be able to make any dent in our society today. Peter and John were going to the temple to pray at three o'clock in the afternoon and what is happening, they were watching as they were going that a man who had been crippled for all his life, from birth, never had one moment of that ability to walk or dance or skip or jump. He was being brought to the temple entrance. He was laid there every single day of his life. What was the purpose of that? Unlike others who went inside the temple to worship God, he was out there begging for a few pennies so that he could have a life. He was begging for alms from those who were going inside. And then looking at uh, Peter and John, he uh, holds his hand out. A man crippled from his birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. We are not unfamiliar with this, I don't believe, for any one of us who has ever been to any uh, church or temple for that matter in India, we know that there are uh, there's a line of beggars outside. This is the church I was attending in, in Hyderabad when I was a little boy. There was a, there was a line probably almost like a couple of hundred uh, yards from the entrance of the church for, for these beggars. And those who were closest to the gate had the best spot. And because people had time to take money out and drop it in their bowls before they entered the, the church. Some of them would be singing, some of them would be chanting, some of them would be simply asking for money. We know the sight. The man held out his hand, asking them for money. This man, I think, is a 
a symbolic presence in this story. A symbolic presence, if you will, of the human condition in the world today. As much as he was physically crippled, not able to move a limb, not able to stand on his own two feet, not able to do anything for himself. The human condition of the human spirit, the human soul is broken today, has been broken ever since sin came into the world. Sin has a way of breaking us, shattering that image of God in us, breaking every piece of us so that we are not any longer able to do and to reflect the glory of God in our lives. Sin shatters human life. As much as this man was laid there to beg, even so the human condition is that now we beg for our sustenance. In all kinds of ways, obviously. And I'm not talking about physical breakdown, I'm talking about emotional breakdown, I'm talking about mental breakdown, I'm talking about a spiritual breakdown, I'm talking about breakdown of the spirit of man today. There is brokenness all over the place. I don't have to give you examples, I'm sure you know those examples yourself. I know that when you go to work you see the brokenness of people. I know that when you are in the circle of your friends around the cooler or water fountain or wherever it is that the conversations that take place there reflect how broken this world is, how fallen we are, how unfulfilled our lives are, how often we complain about the things that happen in life that do not contribute to wholesomeness, that fracture our lives. There are so many people today who are looking for wholeness and meaning and purpose in life, but they don't know where to turn them because they are so into the habit of begging for a living just for the day. I'm thankful that Peter and John did throw some coins in that, into that man's ball and then walk inside and you know, go and have a wonderful prayer time. I hope none of us had to cross anyone on the way to the, tonight as we came to church who was in a broken shape and you didn't have time for them because you were going to church. Reminds me of another story in, in, in the Bible that Jesus told. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. The beautiful story. But it's a very painful story as well. It's a very pathetic story, if you will, because here is a man who was beaten up by the robbers who was simply going on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was there on the side, he was beaten up, bruised, he was robbed and he was thrown there like an animal. And what happens? A priest comes along. A priest is supposed to be what? A, a God's representative. A priest is supposed to be one who has that tremendous sense of care for another human being. What does he do? He looks at him, he passes on because he has other things to do. He's got important things to do. Maybe he's worried about touching this uh, individual and becoming unclean so he cannot perform his religious duties. Whatever his reasons were, I'm not sure. He just passes them along. Then comes the Levite, who's supposed to be a scholar, a theologian, a doctor of the law. What does he do? Does the same thing. Doesn't even give him a second look. Passes on. Maybe he was afraid of his own life. Who knows? If I tarry here for a while, I might be robbed myself, so I better hurry on. He leaves until the Samaritan comes. A nobody, if you will. A total stranger, one who was ostracized, one who was marginalized, one who had no standing in society. He comes along and what does he do? He gets down, goes to the man, binds his wounds, cares for him, picks him up, puts him on his donkey and brings him to an inn and offers money for his care. There are many people who are hurting by friends.
friends. There are many people I know in your own family. Many people that are in your circle of friends, or neighbors, or colleagues. Yes, on the outside they look very happy. On the outside they look like there is no problem. And yet, if you take the time, and if you sit down with them, and you ask them, how are you doing? How is life? What is going on? They will tell you. If they can trust you, they will tell you how miserable life is. They're having financial problems. They're having health issues. They're having problems with their children. They're having problems in their family, in their marriage. They're having all kinds of problems with other people. Don't know how they can make it to the next day, to the next level. Those are the kind of people that are, to me, symbolic representations of the man who was lying there by the entrance of the temple, begging for some sustenance, for something that will give him hope for just a few more hours, just maybe one more day. But I'm thankful that Peter and John just don't throw money at him. They stand there and make a connection. It's very important that we make connections with people. Ever take a moment to look at what happens in coffee fellowship? I'm talking about our coffee time. After we are done here, we go downstairs. We have our coffee time. Who do you talk to? Be honest. Who do you talk to? Who do you gravitate towards? You take your plate of food or your cup of coffee and where do you go? Do you look for a stranger? Do you look for someone in this fellowship? I had seen this person for three or four weeks but I really don't know who that person is. Maybe I should go and introduce myself. Do you do that? Or do you say, oh, here are my friends. I haven't seen them in a whole week. I wonder how she's doing. Uh, uh, you know, and we gravitate to those that, that, that make us feel good. That's natural, understandable, but that's not our mission. Our mission is to reach out to those who are hurting, those who are strangers, those that we do not know, Befriend them. Befriend them. Look around the next time you are in a, in a group, wherever it is, and, and you see people that you know, and if they are your friends, they're not going to become your enemies because you don't talk to them for a few minutes, and if you go and talk to some stranger, it's not going to kill you. Take a few moments. I know how busy we are. I know, I am, but believe me, I, 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 I have in my day only a few hours and and I have to be very, very careful how I, how I portion my time to do what. A lot of things I have to do are kind of maintenance stuff in my work. And I have to make sure that the building is fine. I have to make sure that the things are running fine. I have to make sure that uh, the electricity is on. I have to make sure that water is running. I have to make sure that the children are safe. I have to make sure. So many things that, that, that I worry about and I, I spend my time are maintenance stuff. And so many things, of course, I, I also have to do a lot of spiritual things in the church where I, where I spend my time every day. There are a lot of things to do. People who, who walk in all the time. Some selling things and some doing other things, but I have to spend time. When do I take the time to do what God wants me to do? When do I take the time to listen to where God wants me to go and be? When was the last time you prayed and you said, God, today I want to connect with someone that you would have me connect. Today I want to spend some time with somebody that is in some kind of a need, some kind of trouble. Please make that connection for me. And I want to be your faithful servant in meeting the needs of that person. Like the good Samaritan who left that day. I don't think he had in his agenda, in his plan, to, to stop by and, and take care of this poor uh, stranger and spend his money on him and
spend all that time taking care of him. I don't think he planned it that way, but it happened and he was willing to be a good neighbor. Are you? Am I? It's very difficult, I know, because we are busy people, because we have important things to do. We don't have time to waste on the wayside of life. And yet, my friends, I tell you that when you do take the time to do things that you didn't plan to do, but because you are convinced that this is what God wants me to do, I tell you the rewards of that are beyond any value. God has somebody in mind for you to bless. God has somebody for you to stop and say a word. How are you? Is there anything I can do for you? Some interesting things happen in, in my line of work. You know, uh, I, I go to the hospitals, as, as you know, as part of my job. And sometimes when I go to the hospital, I wear a collar, and you know what it looks like. You know, they, people immediately identify me as, you're a pastor. It's a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> If people know you're a pastor, you can't drive in a certain way. And they look at you and he has a car. Wonder what church he goes to, right? When I'm taking an elevator, if I have a call, people ask me, would you please pray for my sister who's in this hospital? Don't be stranger. No, 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 I'm not here in this hospital to pray for your sister. I need to see my church member. No. Not only do you pray for her sister, do you also pray for her. Go to a place you've never been to. Sit there. Watch me. What do their faces tell you? Are they at peace? Do they tell you that they're going through some anxious moments? Peter and John look at this man and say, no, we don't have the money. We don't have silver or gold. Silver and gold I do not have, says Peter, but what I have I can give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. What boldness. What, what boldness does Peter have to tell this man who was crippled from birth 40 plus years He's been lying there day after day after day and you come along and you say in the name of Jesus rise up and walk. What do you mean? Are you here to insult me? I don't think Peter had a shadow of doubt when he said that. That this man would walk. Because Peter knew that this would be done. He had utmost trust and confidence in the power of God to make sure that this lame man will rise and will walk. Praise be to God. The very next verse says, taking him by the right hand, he held him up, not, not just say the words, but he took him by his hand. He held him and he held him up. And then it says, immediately the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple court, walking and jumping and praising God. For the very first time in his life, he ever was able to go inside the temple because cripples were not allowed inside the temple because they were condemned. The fact that you had a physical disability meant that God is already punishing you for something so how dare you enter the presence of God. For the first time after his healing he is able to walk inside and to see the temple from a point of view that he never had. You can be that person who can enable somebody else to see life in a different perspective, from a different point of view. But it takes 
somebody who knows the power of resurrection. It takes somebody who knows the power of a uh, living God, who can do far beyond what you think you can do. Are you willing to stick your neck out and say yes, God is able to do far beyond what you and I can ask or imagine. God will provide for all your needs. God will care. However broken your life may have been, however distressed your life has been, God is not done with you yet. God is still working in your life. The transformation that we find in this man's life is truly, truly, truly amazing. What I find very interesting about this man, although he was healed on that day, a miracle was performed and people were assembled in the temple to, to look at this man and they recognize here is this guy who has been begging for all his life and now we see him jumping up and down and walking. What a miracle, right? I mean, you would think, you would think that this guy would say bye to the apostles. He said, yeah, I've come in, I've said my thank you to God and I, I've done my part, so I'm going off to spend the rest of my life in catching up with life. All the things I've missed, all the parties that I didn't go to, and all the celebrations that I missed, I'm going to go and enjoy my life. You would think that, that that's what you would do. My friends, this man, incredible. If you read through not only the third chapter, but the fourth chapter, this man is standing with Peter and John as they were being questioned by the Sanhedrin, by the, by the high priest, and by the elders. He is standing with them as the living proof of what God can do. He didn't leave them. He didn't say, thank you guys, whatever you did, I'm happy you did it. No, he wanted to really be in that zone. He wanted to be in that center of God's presence, God's power. I believe that he truly recognized the power of God in his life. Some of you probably have come to know Jesus Christ or have come to experience the power of God because somebody else told you that. Somebody else said, trust in this God. God loves you. God cares for you. And you have come into faith because of the testimony of somebody else. I know there are some of you who have been following other faiths and whatever, and you are here this evening because somebody has done something in your life, and you want to be a testimony to the power and the presence of God in your life. I praise God for you. I also want to say that as a result of this miracle, this transforming power of God in the life of this man, the church was emboldened. The church became a transformed society, a transformed community. My wish and my prayer and my desire is that you is here will be a testimony of the changing and the transforming power of God. In chapter 4 we read three things about the church. As a result, I believe, of what happened in this instance, the church became one. The church was a united church. The church had unity of mind and spirit because they realized that the power that took hold of their lives was far, far excellent and beyond that anything that they could generate. This came from above. They recognized that. The second thing we learn about what happened in this early church in chapter 4 is they began to humble themselves. They began to humble themselves. Nobody said, I am bigger, I am greater than anybody else because, you know what, my friends, in the sight of God, we are all the same. I, I, I don't care what education you have, I don't care how many honors, I mean, whatever else you, you may have, in the sight of God, every one of us is standing on equal ground. There was humility in the early church. Along with unity and humility, there was a spirit 
a true spirit of caring for those in need. That's the hallmark of the Church of Jesus Christ. Do we have a caring spirit in our fellowship? Do we care for every single person? Or do we only care about a few people? A very important lesson. If there is even one person in this fellowship who is neglected, who is not cared for, then that is a mark on our discipleship. Let there be unity among us. Let there be humility in us. And let there be a true spirit of care. Not only for each other, but for anyone in need. Because that's what the Bible says. Anyone who had any need when they came to the church, that need was met. Financial, spiritual, whatever. God has wonderful things in store for us, for our personal lives, for our families, and for the fellowship. My prayer is that we will be true to what God has called us and what God has entrusted into our hands, that we may be faithful in fulfilling His call and His mission. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you praise, we give you thanks for this wonderful instance of uh, the healing that uh, brought such a tremendous change, not only in the life of that man who was lame from birth, but who also was instrumental in bringing newness in the church. We thank you. We thank you for those who challenge us day to day, who uh, set a great example before us for what it means to know the power of God and to be transformed by the power of God in our lives. And I thank you for this wonderful lesson, for this story, and for what it uh, teaches us. Pray, God, that we not only hear these things, but also allow the Spirit of God to move in and through us and be a blessing for others. We ask all of this with thanksgiving and gratitude in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.